Good evening, folks. I'm not going to use the mic. Uh, my name is Brent Miller. I'm the immediate past president of the Friends of the Page Walker. And we want to welcome you here to uh, one of our historic preservation programs, one in a series. This is about our eighth year of doing them. And tonight we are very fortunate to have Paul Kleimer. He is the Video Lab Supervisor of the Packard Campus Audio Visual Conservation Center, which you see up here. That is uh, a facility where the Library of Congress acquires, preserves, and provides access to the world's largest and most comprehensive collection of films, television programs, radio broadcasts, and sound recordings. He's going to give us some behind the scenes information. I think he's going to start with the video, but Paul, all yours. Thank you for coming. National Library of the United States, the home of the Copyright Office, and the recipient of many donations of sound, recorded sound, and film, and television, video, we have a unique opportunity now that we can bring it all together in one place. The audiovisual creativity of the American people really transformed the audiovisual perception of the world in the 20th century. It's a huge American accomplishment. Founded in 1800, the Library of Congress is the nation's oldest federal cultural institution and the largest library in the world. It seeks to spark imagination and creativity and to further human understanding and wisdom by providing access to knowledge through its magnificent collections, programs, and exhibitions. The mission of the Library of Congress? To make its resources available and useful to the Congress and to the American people, and to sustain and preserve its collections for generations to come. Over 80% of American movies made between 1893 and 1930 have been lost. The Library of Congress Packer Campus for Audiovisual Conservation represents a unique private-public partnership between the Packard Humanities Institute, the U.S. Congress, and the Library of Congress. The gift of the Packard Campus is the culmination of years of vision and effort put forth by the Packard Humanities Institute and Congress in particular, who recognize the value of preserving the past in order to inform the future. The reason that we can do this is because of the achievements of the thousands and tens of thousands of employees of the Hewlett Packard Company over the years, especially in the first 50 years. And I think that they should really take the most pride in this. I don't think anyone should give me credit for it. Thanks to David Woodley Packard's deep understanding of the value and necessity of preserving America's audiovisual heritage, we will be able to sustain an audiovisual legacy otherwise lost to the ravages of time or indifference. David's background is in the study of, of early Greek civilization and Roman culture. And from his own studies, uh, he realized that looking at the fragments of cultures gives a very incomplete record of, of what survived from thousands of years ago. And I, I think it's fair to say that he did not want that to happen to American culture. And so that was very much, I think, the motive spirit behind the creation of this Packard campus. Until this moment in history, the ongoing abilities and capabilities to preserve and to conserve the nation's audiovisual record have been limited. The gift of the Packard Campus, designed to grow and change with contemporary and future technology challenges, changes all of that. For the creative well-being of, of a country, of a, of a society, you have to have a collective memory. You have to have, you have, to have a foundation or, or a rich, fertile ground for creativity to sprout. And art, art doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens 
because uh, there's this rich background, rich history, rich traditions, and, and someone with genius does something new from that. When you look at recorded sound, television and motion pictures, you're really seeing uh, a great part of the history of America that can get captured in those. And, it, and they're also a media that people are attracted to. So it's a great way, a way to tell the story of America and with six million items, an amazing um, spread of creativity. audiovisual materials. The Packer Campus houses the entire collection, including theatrical films, newsreels, television programs, radio broadcasts, early voice recordings of historical figures, and commercial sound recordings. We have 1.2 million moving image items, and that includes about 700,000 videotape, 500,000 reels of film. We get in about 30,000 items through copyright every year, but we also take in uh, some very large film and video collections through uh, gift and purchase every year as well. In the early days of moving pictures, producers filed paper prints of their projects with the Copyright Office of the Library of Congress. So they would send them to the Library of Congress to prevent piracy. And we have thousands of films that only survive on paper. Unfortunately, the films are lost. Innovative custom technologies unique to the Packard campus give conservators new tools to recover treasures from the past. We're now transferring the films. We're rephotographing them off of the paper back onto film so we can restore the titles. One of the, the key functions of the Packard campus is to preserve the film record of productions from the 19th century up till about 1951. And that particular type of film was known as nitrate film because of the composition of the materials from which it was produced. And so it, it had the inherent capability of being flammable, intensely flammable. So we have a special set of coal vaults for uh, a collection of nitrate film that amounts to about 140 to 50 million feet of nitrate film. This is one of our uh, nitrate acclimatization vaults. And in here, we have uh, actually two collections that we just received in the past week or so of uh, nitrate prints. These all came out of a, a barn in Tennessee where they were very uh, lovingly looked after by their owner who had turned them over to the library. Uh, now on the other hand, not all films survive as well. And then you can see with this reel, which is probably from the 1920s, uh, the brown powder that's appearing is actually the film breaking down. There may be still some photography in there that we can save, but a good portion of it is going to have to be cut out because it's just deteriorated beyond the world. <clears throat> a lot of it is studio material, the original camera negatives for practically all of the films released by Warner Brothers in Columbia during that period. This is where we focus our attention in our film preservation laboratory in making new safety copies from those nitrate prints. Ultimately our goal is to, to have these films around for future generations and we're talking uh, not necessarily our, our grandchildren but our grandchildren's grandchildren. So we want to have this stuff around for a very long period of time. Of all sound recordings released in the U.S. from the 19th century through the end of 1965, more than 85% are no longer commercially available to the public. The Packard campus is also home to specialized audio preservation laboratories. Here, our audio department restores, preserves, and conserves every known format of recorded sound. The collections range from the wax cylinders used in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to today's CDs, MP3s, and every other digital technology. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly
Thank you very, very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to kick off our show tonight with Benny Goodman and his all-stars from Bay Street. They've been busting every record in the country. So let's have a tremendous hand for his all-stars. generation. One of our goals here at the Library of Congress is to be able to do this same thing using digital technology for the next 50, 100, 200 years. That's an incredible challenge because the digital world is very different from the analog world. But that's essentially where we want to go so that the people 50 years from now can hear exactly what we're hearing in this great sounding room now. The Library of Congress is home to both the National Recording Preservation Board and the National Film Preservation Board to ensure the increased public access to America's sound recording and film heritage. More than 65% of television programs produced in America since the 1940s are not available in archives and may be lost forever. There's a lot of forgotten humor. That's just one form of creativity in which we have a particularly rich collection. And uh, with the Bob Hope's <laughs> jukebox full of, full of 80,000 pages, of jokes. We have a wonderful <laughs> clip of uh, Johnny Carson interviewing Groucho Marx after he got a letter inviting him to contribute to the Library of Congress. It's, it's, it's hilarious. Dear Mr. Marx, and uh, so forth and so on and so on and so on and so on. He's the librarian of, of Congress. May I ask if you've made suitable, suitable provision for preserving your personal papers? If not, I invite you to consider the claims of the Library of Congress as an appropriate repository. In the library's manuscript division, they found many of the nation's manuscript treasures, including the personal papers of most of the presidents. This is all legitimate. The correspondence of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. You don't have to read the whole thing. That's the idea. It's rather a Grant, Abraham Lincoln. You're going to mumble all through this? I think that is was an extraordinary. I was so astonished. I think that people will find sources of renewal. Anything that's a renaissance is a rebirth of something that was there before. All of this is part of an ongoing pageant of creativity of which humor is a, is a great part. I think people are going to have a lot of fun with this and uh, we're, we hope that the enthusiasm keeps going. Serious study, serious preservation doesn't mean that people can't have fun with it and that in having fun you don't get new ideas. That's part of creativity after all. If we lose our past, you really can never recapture that. Right? And we have lost things through the years, and there have been some major losses. And if you have the ability to keep it, do keep it, because it will be instructive and useful for generations, centuries from now. We're positioned to begin ingesting and preserving and reformatting the materials that, that will be invented in the future that we know nothing about. So we look backward and we look forward, and that's unique. There's no institution quite like the Packard campus, and I must say the Library of Congress, anywhere in the world.
presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov. Okay, well, unfortunately, we're out of time now. <laughs> Here, let's. Um, I have to do a bunch of things on the computer now. now. No? Here we go. Here we are. Uh, let's see. Uh, my name's Paul Alclaimer. Uh, I am the Video Lab Supervisor, and I was a Right there for a while in, the, in the, uh, the clip you just watched, they wouldn't say anything about the video lab. Interestingly, the one clip they did show you of the Groucho Marx on uh, the Tonight Show, uh, that I think came from a uh, kinescope, so technically that's from the film lab, not from the video lab. We do principally videotapes, and uh, a lot of the very old stuff uh, does not show up on videotape. This, you might... Uh, from that video, you got the impression that we were somewhere around Washington. And unfortunately, when I took this job, a lot of people thought I was somewhere around Washington. So they'd call me up and say, hey, I'm going to be in Washington. Uh, can you meet me for lunch? I said, not really. Oh, we're way down there in Culpeper, 75 miles outside of Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, we're there here in the Star. And as you can see, there's Raleigh down there. Some of you may have been there. And, uh, <laughs> DC's uh, up and uh, over there. So um, interesting selection for the uh, for this location um, is that this used to be the Packard campus before it was the Packard campus. Uh, this is a Federal Reserve uh, facility where it was a gold repository and it was in Mount Pony. It was actually built into the mountain. And during the Cold War, it was located in a mountain. 75 miles outside of Washington, D.C., because they figured that's going to be about the blast radius <laughs> that they could manage. And the Federal Reserve was very concerned that if Washington got blown up, your money would be worthless. Uh, so they put a whole bunch of gold here. Unfortunately, at the pace that the federal government works, they finished somewhere in the early 90s. <laughs> so that uh, the Cold War ended. Uh, there was gold in this building. Uh, interesting thing is uh, the uh, white guard shack at the front. We have a guard shack, but it's, they had machine guns and everything there. Uh, there was an indoor rifle range because they didn't want satellite photography to show off how many guards worked there at any particular time. I guess counting the cars in the parking lot didn't. That technology didn't exist yet. Anyway, this facility uh, was closed and the gold all taken away. Uh, and then in about 2005, it reverted, to, it reverted back to the hands of the government. The government sold it to the Packard Institute for the uh, Humanities Institute, PHI. And they bought it for a dollar. Uh, then they built all the rest of this park up next to it. So uh, the yellow rectangle over there is the original Federal Reserve building. All the rest, the uh, what we call the radial area, which is that curved thing that you saw in all those pictures, that's actually the back of the building. Um, this looks out across the hill and toward the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's a very lovely view. Um, over here, that's actually our parking lot. This is the conference room. But the entrance that you'll see on the later one is actually that little area right there. The art theater is uh, in that section. Anyway, uh, this is an old slide. Uh, the building is uh, completely uh, much better now. Uh, it looks a lot more like this. This is 2006. This is still before we were open. Uh, but now you can see the form of the parking lot. Uh, you can also see where the collection storage is on the one wing, which was the Federal Reserve side. Uh, the uh, uh, air conditioning and all the uh, mechanicals and plumbing and everything, they also are uh, on that wing over there. Uh, the conservation building, the radial area, and the big square box in the middle. And then over here are the nitrate vaults. And you notice they're built off on one side, completely away from everything else. Um, it is not true that nitrate film is explosive, because it isn't. It is true that it will burn underwater, because it has its own oxidizer. So 
this really is a perplexing problem for uh, fire departments because they don't know what to deal with this. It's how do you put out something that burns underwater? It, it, it'll burn into vacuum. It has its own oxidizer. So uh, it's really an issue. And I'll show you later how uh, nitrate vaults uh, traditionally have been built and um, some more about that. Here's our front entrance, and here's that uh, beautiful uh, conference room I spend two hours a week in. Uh, there's the front door. Uh, there's actually a person standing in the front of there. Um, it's interesting to see these slides, because these slides are actually quite old. Uh, uh, the head of the film lab, Kim Weissman, who you actually saw in that video, he's lost, by the way, about 100 pounds. It's funny seeing all these people about, you know, from long ago. Anyway, Ken and I exchanged PowerPoint presentations. Uh, he did two of mine, and um, some of the slides I freely borrowed from his, uh, his uh, but these uh, slides are uh, quite old. This one is probably 2006 or so. No, 2007. Anyway, the trees are all different now, and everything looks different. Um, this is where the ivy first started growing on the uh, radial area, and uh, it was, uh, it's, uh, Beautiful. Unfortunately, not in the winter time. It's not this green right now, and it kind of looks like uh, a whole bunch of uh, weeds that are growing on the back of the building. How did this building get built? Well, you heard about the Packard Insti uh, the uh, the uh, Packard uh, Humanities Institute, and you heard about the Federal Repository. Uh, unique partnership between the U.S. Congress, Packard Humanities Institute, and the Library of Congress and the Architect of the Capitol. Uh, PHI provided $155 million uh, to uh, build this facility, to design and build it. Um, uh, Congress then authorized another $80 million to go into this facility for equipment, uh, HVAC uh, improvements. A lot of this had to do with the environmentals for the collections areas. So uh, we can maintain the uh, humidity and the temperature very tight constraints. Unfortunately, we can't do that through the where the people are, but but in the collection area, we're real good. Um, when completed in 2007, PHI gift to the nation was the largest private donation ever made to the Library of Congress and remains to this day. Uh, so that's uh, uh, amazing what uh, David Packard and his people did. Uh, collections, uh, you heard some of these numbers from the uh, presentation, which was supposed to be at the end of it. Uh, over one and a half million moving image collection items, uh, films, video, uh, as you heard uh, Mike Michon, who's my boss, uh, say about 700,000 of those are videotapes. Um, newsreel and so on. Three million audio collection items. A lot of these are everything from wire recordings, uh, music box discs, um, uh, LPs, 45s, 78s, you name it. Uh, there were a lot of different uh, formats for audio. Uh, audio from uh, a radio broadcast, they used to have these big uh, 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 preservation uh, discs. Uh, 1.7 million supporting documents, screen pennies, manuscripts, photographs, and press kits. Total of 6.3 million. That was back then, I'm pretty sure we're over 7 million now because we do get some very large uh, collections. Uh, not long ago, we had the Bob Hope collection, uh, as you saw there. Uh, Jerry Lewis is, I think, the most recent one. And we have all of his, uh, his uh, content. Um, Dick Cavett, uh, his television show, is absolutely amazing because it was in the 70s, and I remember all these people. But he had, for instance, Muhammad Ali on three times, one time with Norman Mailer. So it was a fascinating short show to see Norman Mailer telling Muhammad Ali everything about boxing. It's, it's, it's <laughs> Um, yeah, a lot of this slide is, uh, is a recap from the other. Uh, consolidates collections that were stored in four states and the District of Columbia in a new facility with state-of-the-art environmental controls and 25 years of collection growth. Funny secret, we're full. Um, <laughs> you know, and we always say, you know, we, and we'll have space for it now. Because nature abhors a vacuum and, and, and archivists abhor an empty room, and so we're, we're slammed right now. Uh, utilizes diverse modes of preservation from hands-on boutique, 
copying of rare, fragile materials to streamline robotic transfers. You actually did see uh, some of the video of the robot there. Uh, we have uh, four robots in uh, the video lab. Uh, three of them for three-quarter inch matic and one for VHS, and those by far outproduce everything else in the entire facility, including recorded sound and, and uh, film. We started the facility with a 30-year backlog from the Copyright Office of analog materials. And it was brought up that there's no way that you're going to transfer all these three-quarter inch tapes before the oxide falls off the tape and they're completely unreadable. Uh, we're really looking at probably 18 to 24 months and we're done with the analog backlog, uh, simply because of the robots. Which I just realized I told that story and there's a later slide that uh, completely uh, I won't have to go over. Uh, so what do we do there? Uh, you know, you got kind of a flavor for it, so uh, but uh, it is uh, the nation's digital archive for film, video, and recorded sound. Uh, it's the media archive for the uh, Copyright Office. You heard Mike say that we get uh, really from the Copyright Office. Actually, about 66% of our, uh, our uh, collections come from, to us from the Copyright Office. Uh, the connection with the Copyright Office started under the administration of um, Ulysses S. Grant uh, after, uh, after the war. Uh, the Library of Congress was asking for more money, and he said, well, what do you need money for? The Copyright Office has got all these books. Well, it, it continued on from then. Uh, we do have free screenings of silent, classic, and cult films three nights a week. So if you're ever in Culpeper, I'll give you the URL that you can actually see what movies are playing when. Uh, but um, we do a lot more than that. Uh, we have a film lab a full-service, black and white currently, film lab. Uh, we have only recently uh, done more as far as film scanning goes. This facility was actually built to be a photochemical restoration and preservation facility. Now that you can barely buy 35 millimeter film stock, they've re-examined their position as far as being an analog preservation facility and now the film lab is really the last one to come on board with the digital preservation. Originally, obviously, it, it, it shows up in the video lab as one of the first places, and the audio lab. Actually, audio, uh, uh, recorded sound digital before anybody else with uh, CDs. Uh, not that CDs are a good example, but... Um, so, um, both, all three, the film, the video, and the recorded sound lab, uh, does digitization and archive. This is a comedic slide. What we are not, we are not the conservator of the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. Those are NARA, that's the National Archive. And it's under the executive branch, we're under the legislative branch. So uh, we like to think we're the kind of gentler, kind of fuzzy uh, library as opposed to NARA. Uh, but uh, we actually do a lot of the same things. NARA, interestingly enough, being under the executive branch, they have World War II footage a lot more than we have. We have World War II footage, but they tend to be from civilians who were there shooting stuff. Uh, interestingly enough, for some reason, the Marine Corps had some falling out with NARA at once upon a time, so we are loaded with Marine Corps uh, stuff. But you know all those Marines, they'll pick a fight with you. Um, no, and we don't give books to the general public, but your uh, congressmen or senators can borrow books. Uh, we'll provide them. In fact, we have uh, uh, services just specifically for Congress up on Capitol Hill. Uh, we don't have library police, but we used to. Uh, it used to be that every, uh, every bureaucracy in the federal government had their own police department, and they, they've stopped. I can't imagine telling somebody that you're a life of your police officer. Oh, really? Where? The library. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm going to explain a little bit. It's 8 o'clock. It is 8 o'clock. About how the libraries work. I don't know really turn to um, The three A's of a library. There's sessioning, archiving, and access. Okay? Accessioning is getting it all together, 
getting it organized and cataloged, and getting it ready to be put on a shelf. And a shelf is the archiving component of it, but it doesn't do anybody any good if it just sits on a shelf. Because that's called a dark archive, and that's what, or warehousing. We don't want that. It's, I think the video made clear that we are there so people can have access to these, uh, uh, these classic uh, titles and things. Um, accessioning, it doesn't do you any good if you can't find anything. Otherwise, that's just called like a teenager's room where everything is in there, but nobody can find any of it. So this is, this is a very, very generalized block diagram of flow of the work through our facility. Um, and as you'll see, this collection item processing unit and catalog. All right, this would be a brand new collection item that comes into our facility. It goes to the processing unit. The processing unit is two things. It is, uh, there's a physical storage because it's a physical item that needs to be stored someplace, and there's cataloging of it. That, generally speaking, those three blocks, the four blocks, uh, that's the accession component of all of this. Over there are the film lab, the video lab, and recorded sound labs, and uh, you see they actually get that content in a, in a mode where it can be put into either the digital archive, or in the case, we still have a film archive. We don't burn the film when we're done scanning it. And frequently, we don't scan the film at all unless it rises to, because our scanning capability is still limited. OK, so we have a film archive. That film gets inspected. People look at it. They make sure uh, it's uh, good to go and be put in. Uh, a lot of times, if the film is badly degenerated, they'll go ahead and strike a print of it or make a duplicate analog on safety film so that we know that safety film will be around in 20, 25 years when they finally get around to redoing things. But the recorded sound lab and the video lab, they mostly just digitize stuff. <coughs> Staffing. Um, this is actually an old slide, and I don't think we have 110 people anymore. I think it's around 105. Um, that includes 11 people up in, uh, up in the reading rooms in, on Capitol Hill. In the Madison building, there is a recorded sound reading room and a, um, uh, a film reading room and a video reading room. And the great thing about those reading rooms is you can sit down and you can actually play a file on a computer in a reading room and watch anything in the library. Not only that, is you can access a you, you can, in most cases, you will tell the person there in the reading room what you're interested in, and he'll find three or four things and get them ready for you so you can play them. Why is it that you have to go to this reading room and you can't just do that at home and uh, look at it on YouTube or something on your computer? Copyright. We are the archive for the copyright office. And the exemption to the copyright law is anybody can see anything they want as long as they're in the reading room. That's like a magical space because it's exempt from the laws of the copyright. We can't put it out there because otherwise, next big Fox theater, uh, next big Fox release out to theaters. One week later, you can watch it at home on the Library of Congress website. I don't think we, we, we get along very well with Fox. Anymore. So, uh, so the reading room is a very, very important thing. By the way, the reading rooms are open to the public, but you have to go to Washington, D.C. Um, there is an idea that they would like to make duplicates of the reading rooms at, let's say, college campuses across the country, because they already have a lot of this infrastructure in place. But it will require legislation. And legislation takes Years, so uh, don't uh, don't uh, uh, run over Chapel Hill and expect to see these things. Besides, UVA is the first one that uh, is on the list. Go figure. Um, thirty-two moving image processing and curatorial reference staff. Okay, so these thirty-two people, they are that triangle of blocks that in the accession. They are the curatorial and the processing people. Oh, that's my phone. <laughs> oh, that's my wife. 
Um, <laughs> 29 recorded sound process and curatorial and reference. This is just moving image, so this is film and video. These 29, they do recorded sound, records, wire recordings, open reel, you name it. Um, interestingly enough, this is all the accessioning stuff. The processing people that are in the middle that are actually doing the digitization is only 29. And that's both in recorded sound and film. So, um, film, sound, uh, film and uh, uh, recorded sound. So, uh, it's a lot. When I first got there, I thought, oh, this video stuff, you know, we'll get this. This is the big thing. No, no, it really isn't. This is sessioning. Is nothing is more important. Because uh, without a record, without a findable means of finding things and, and, and having it organized, the rest of this really doesn't matter. Because it'd just be, uh, uh, it would be like the warehouse and the last scene of Indiana Jones, uh, what we have actually a room called the Indiana Jones room, where it would be <laughs> thousands of pa boxes and crates and you would have absolutely no chance of ever finding them. Um, AV Preservation Services staff and 20, uh, the 20 administrative staff. They're the ones that call all the meetings and keep us from getting in. <laughs> <coughs> the, um, this, you saw some of this in the video. In fact, you probably saw better pictures of it in the video. Uh, this is uh, some of our vaults. Uh, this obviously, this is a strange picture because this isn't one picture, it's three. Uh, their 35-millimeter uh, film, for instance, isn't in the same vault as open reel uh, magnetic uh, audio tape, which is on the far side there. The thing in the mid, yes, honey. <laughs> the thing in the middle uh, is the uh, video vault. So, unfortunately, I didn't have a still of like an infinite number of videotapes. So, uh, uh, this is the this is the hallway outside it. But I didn't want to include at least one shot of a hallway that goes to the vanishing point. We have a lot of those uh, in our facility. Um, these are uh, LP records, uh, 33 to 3rd. Some of you old enough might remember college dorms that were festooned with uh, these kind of things. Uh, we, have, we have fancier shells. That's what we want to do. Um, and on the far side over there, that uh, rather attractive box that's sitting next to the red canister. The red canister is a uh, gas of, of fire suppression. Uh, the box next to it uh, is um, music box discs. Uh, they uh, have discs that the original old music boxes, mm -hmm. not the ones that you wind up in you know, like your jewelry case, but the big ones that had in replaceable discs. And the thing in the middle here is another hallway that goes to the vanishing point. Now that's the nitrate vaults. Mm -hmm. And the thing I was going to say earlier about the nitrate vaults, you notice all the doors. You can't put the fire out, but you can contain it if you flood it with water, which keeps it cold, cooler, and it keeps it from spreading. So you're going to lose the one small room, the vault that you're in, but you won't lose the adjacent ones. And that's how those were built. When I first uh, uh, went to uh, Hollywood and was working at the uh, Warner Brothers lot, um, there were used to be dozens of uh, nitrate vaults there. Um, and they all had the same thing. It was a crazy looking building. It looked like an office building, but every office was only five feet wide and had one door. <laughs> oh, and there was also a water main that ran all the way across the back of the building. And I mean a huge water main that ran all the way across and they would just dump water in. Yes, you have a question? Is the intention to take uh, the nitrate film and put them on a more stable media? Okay. It was at one time. Okay. Acetate-based film is called safety film. Uh, Nitrate-based film is called unsafety film or, or, or something else. Acetate, however, is not a stable film either because it's subject, it's uh, a subject to uh, vinegar syndrome. And vinegar syndrome is where the film, the acetic acid, actually bleeds out of the um, base of the film, and uh, uh, it's uh, contagious. If one roll of film in a room full of acetate starts smelling, uh, soon all the rest of them will. And the only th it's almost like a disease. You have to take 
the affected roles completely out of that room. Uh, at Warner Brothers, we had sensors in the uh, air conditioning lines, uh, ducts. And the only thing you look for is acetic acid. Because if you sense it, you see acetic acid, you just start immediately going through the entire room. Um, so, whereas nitrate film, as bad as the one that George Willeman had on in the video, is bad, that film's over 100 years old. And it was stored improperly. Properly stored nitrate film looks great after about 100 years. Not so with, uh, with uh, acetate-based film. So, uh, once upon a time, the idea was they'd constantly keep moving it to acetate, from nitrate to acetate, and then they'd keep making clones of that. Uh, nowadays, it looks like what we'll do is we'll scan the nitrate, skip the acetate component completely, and uh, uh, save files. Um, there, there are a number of problems with that. I think I've got a slide, so I'm not going to say any more because then I don't have to talk about that slide. Um, anyway, I think we're done with this. These are, this is non-physical media storage. This on the left is um, a whole bunch of racks. And in those racks is one petabyte of storage, disk storage, spinning disk. Really fast, really nice. On the other side is a multi-petabyte robotic uh, storage. It's tape, it's, it's individual tapes, but there's a robot that moves the tapes around and puts them in various drives. Uh, we use the Storage Tech T10,000 uh, tapes. Uh, they were better for our, our better suited for our purposes. So there's one petabyte over here, and this box over here can, I think, hold. Uh, it can archive and access uh, 100 petabytes. So 100 petabytes in a room. That sounds like uh, so big deal. So what is 100 pet petabytes? Well, 100 petabytes. Um, We'll work our way up. 45 minute stereo audio. This is like an LP. It's about one and a half gigabytes, uncompressed, just the way it is. I know MP3s and things that you download from iTunes are much, much smaller than that. But the reason is, is they use data compression. This is completely uncompressed, and it's at 96 kilohertz uh, sampling rate, which I won't get into. 60 minute uh, standard definition TV show. Uh, I can't say Johnny Carson, but uh, uh, something was 60 minutes long. Um, uh, Rowan and Martin's Laughing, we did those a uh, couple, uh, couple of winners. Um, that's about 24 gigabytes. Now, that is, there is a compression component to that, but it's mathematically lossless. It's completely reversible compression. 100 minute color movie. 2K resolution, which is about what you'll see in a digital cinema theater, uh, is about one and a half terabytes. And one terabyte, so one petabyte, using this, one petabyte is 700,000 LPs, or is 43,690 hours of standard definition television, or it's 600 feature films. Now that's just on the spinning disc that you saw on the left side. It's a hundred times those numbers in the tape robot on the other side. Uh, currently, what we've been able to digitize so far is about five, almost five and a half petabytes, uh, which is uh, an enormous amount. And again, a lot of it had to do with those robots. I'm going to get a little technical here because uh, I have to. Uh, there is a school of thought that film is a gift from God, and we must never, ever step away and stop loving that film. I think, at least for me, it's the performances that occur on those films. Judy Garland is more compelling than 35 millimeter acetate film. <laughs> so, when we're stepping away from doing things on film, we're not apostates, we're not evil, we're not doing things because it's cheap. We're doing things for all of these reasons right here. One, and first and foremost, and I used to have lots of discussions with the head of the film lab, yes. analog duplication is never, ever, ever achieved without a degradation of the image quality. It has to. 
even if you have everything focused to perfection, a piece of dirt that lands in your skin, in, in, in this copy will be in every subsequent copy that you ever have for all time. Now let's say you have to every 20 years make a new print of a movie and every time a new piece of lint lands somewhere on it, 100 years from now, it's going to look like a mess. And then you're, what you're going to do, you're going to go back to the original film elements that you archive, and each time it just expands. So it's a big problem. But you can never duplicate an analog. Even if it's just, I'm going to record this album on a cassette. It's all analog. should be perfect. Well, no, it is. File duplication results in no degradation. If you do your taxes on a spreadsheet, and you send that spreadsheet to your accountant, who is then going to take those numbers to prepare your taxes, $100,000 doesn't turn into $116,000 because of analog degradation. Those numbers are always going to be the same. And we can prove it. Fixity checks are what we use every day. It's a checksum. Without getting into the math, Imagine adding up all the numbers this way in a the file, then adding up all the numbers this way in the file, and you end up with a great, great, great big number. If even one bit changes in that entire file, that number will be totally different. That's a checksum. And at the Library of Congress, we use SHA-1 checksums at every stage of that file's life, from the time we create the file, as we move it through our various storage mediums, we check that checksum constantly. Better yet, we save that checksum so in 50 years when somebody pulls that file down, they'll know they're looking at exactly, bit for bit, exactly the same file that was created in 2015. This is something you cannot have in an analog medium. There is no similar function whatsoever. Okay, access. I love videotapes. Boy, I sure... I love these videotapes. Videotapes are so important in my life. But can I play a 50-year-old videotape in my house? No, I don't have a two-inch quadruplex videotape machine. I just never, I've worked on them before in my career, but I just never thought to buy one. Um, not only that, but I can download that, uh, uh, that, uh, Ed Sullivan Show on YouTube, and I can watch it. I can download a Green Acres episode, and I can watch that. Both of those shows were done on two-inch quadruplex videotape. So I don't need one if I've got a computer, except somebody's going to the trouble of digitizing that show. More importantly, at the very bottom, can you keep a 50-year-old videotape machine running today, or 20 years from now, or 50 years from now? The thing that's interesting is there's enough of these old tape machines around now, but I'm 60 years old and I'm of the last generation of guys that worked on these tape machines. So when I retire, I'm the last of the crop. There's no more guys out there that know how to work on an RCA TR 600. They're just old. Um, unless you're learning it today from somebody. So, the inability to access these files, the inability to access these videotapes in the future, because the tape machines don't work anymore, because the people that fix them are gone, or because the media itself has fallen apart and all the oxides fallen out. The, all of these reasons we need to get to this stuff today. We need to get these things digitized today. Uh, there's two models of archive, and we You've seen a bunch of this recently. There's a film studio. Film studios did this for a century. You get a really, really, really cold room, and you put all your film in it for 100 years. And you might go and look at it every once in a while, but probably not unless it's an A-title. It's unless it's gone with the wind. You're, it just sits there. And believe it or not, this works. Especially worked well with nitrate film. I, I acetate uh, safety film didn't work nearly as well because of the uh, vinegar syndrome. Data model. You make a tape backup of all your data, and every five years you move it to the next format. And this drives studio people absolutely 
just off the edge. Because this costs me money every year. And it costs me just as much money for the A title, The Gone with the Wind, as it does for the for the B movies that nobody's ever going to, you know, the Republic serial, Western serials, and stuff like that. So this drives them crazy. The only time the studio makes money is when it's in release. It's when the title's in release, not when it's sitting in a vault. So they love this model, but, and it's been very difficult. We've had meetings with uh, uh, the Motion Picture Academy, and the very first thing we had to get them off of is this notion. They wanted a digital preservation system that worked for 100 years. <laughs> What's it going to go in? Is it going to go in like a, a, a box? that has what kind of cable coming out the back? <laughs> USB 3? I don't know that you'll find a USB 3 uh, a bus in 100 years. The problem becomes you have to warehouse all the pieces of it, including the computer. You can't, you can't do that. Um, I always brought up the uh, analogy of the movie, uh, one of my favorites, The Time Machine. Uh, the spinning rings, and you'd spin them, and it could tell you what happened before the Holocaust and the end of the world and everything. Well, that was a great device for exposition in the movie and the book, but it, it wouldn't work. Even You'd have to archive even the power supply and everything else that ran. So that really, really doesn't work. Um, that's Brian. Uh, he's one of our recorded sound guys. And you see, he's got multiple audio cassette decks in front of him. And he's digitizing all of those at the same time. That was one of the impetuses in this facility, is to do more, is get this stuff digitized and get going on it. On the far right over there is uh, the SAMR robots. The SAMR robots were actually designed, actually, they were spec for the Library of Congress to do this kind of work. Uh, we, uh, we made recommendations of what it needed to do, and the vendor provided those, and we have four of those, and it's actually a commercial product now. Um, but those were developed for the library to get this stuff done. And certainly in the case of the robots over there, the, uh, the blue boxes, uh, they've done quite well. Um, this is one of Ken's old slides. Uh, new software has been developed for the PEC, the Packard campus, that integrates our systems. Oh, uh, we did also get a new database called Mavis. Uh, this has the media uh, archive. Uh, media, uh, moving image, audio, recorded sound, I think something like Mavis, that's an acronym naturally. Um, uh, but from my desk, I can access the entire catalog and see what we've got. Uh, we also have workflow software, uh, it's called PACWA, uh, the Packard Campus Workflow Application. Uh, PACWA uh, allows me to look at all my jobs as going through my lab and see uh, which ones are behind, is everything going well, are we jammed up on stuff, do we have all our elements available to make, uh, to, to do what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, all of these things were developed for uh, the Packard campus, and uh, for the most part, we're actually going, uh, doing a major uh, update to Packwell right now. Uh, there are a lot of limitations, but that's, software is never done. You're always developing and you're always uh, uh, expanding upon its capabilities. We found a lot of limitations. Um, as you might imagine, we do a lot of collaboration with our IT group. Um, uh, these are the people that bought and either, uh, built the uh, facility, designed the facility, uh, installed the equipment, uh, wrote the software. Uh, uh, Gus McGurk did the uh, PACWA software. Uh, ITS, um, it's, this is actually the best relationship I've ever had with IT and uh, movie studios where I used to work. Uh, it was uh, open, uh, it was just, they would do anything but help you. Um, uh, the, the three guys that we've got in our facility now do a great job and really helped out a lot. <coughs> For those propeller heads that really want to know what we are got. Recorded sound uses a 96 kilohertz, kilohertz, 24-bit broadcast wave file. That's their principal file. They also, in some cases, create a proxy file. It's a lower bitrate version. Could be an MPEG, uh, uh, MP3 file, but uh, and that's for accessing it on the internet. You need something smaller to access on the internet. This file here is just probably too big for most uh, uh, 
for most of the access, as you can um, the, uh, um, remember that they actually watch it live streaming in Washington, D.C. at the reading rooms uh, from our facility. So we have to, we have to uh, help them out a little bit. Uh, video to, uh, goes to JPEG 2000, uh, MXF OP1A. Uh, we use a reversible codec. What reversible means is like a zip. Uh, if you zip a file on your computer, it makes it smaller, but it doesn't change it in the numbers or anything inside. So it's mathematically lossless, completely reversible. That's the type of codec we use for our images. So we can go all the way back to the original image without any degradation whatsoever. An MPEG-4 file or something that you see, like the uh, Library of Congress video you saw, that was at a much lower bit rate. It was heavily compressed, and you can see, certainly from up here, you can see the compression of that. Uh, we don't want to do that. Uh, film. Okay, so film, we're, we're, we're now doing film, the digital file, uh, 2K from 16 millimeter, 4K resolution, uh, 4,096 pixels all the way across the picture. Uh, on 35 millimeter, and uh, we also do uh, like 2K from uh, uh, paper prints because really there's not that much resolution there after it's gone from film to paper and back to film again. It's a pretty bad shape. Uh, we still do film to film, and we, as I pointed out before, we, we make proxies of all of these so they can be watched uh, in a reasonable period of time in the uh, reading room. Okay, other file collections. So, there are a lot more things going on now than were envisioned in that video you saw. In that video you saw, all collections are physical media, and we're going to convert those to digital. Well, what if they're already digital? Now what do you do? Um, the LOC has through the Copyright Office a huge collection of computer and video games. Uh, Duke Nukem, um, uh, any number of video games that either you or your progeny have wasted countless hours on, we have. Um, what do you do with that? I mean, we have software that ran on PDP-11s. Some of us are old enough to remember PDP-11s, but none of us have an, uh, a working one. So if nobody has a working PDP-11, how do you ever play that file? How do you ever play that game anymore? Well, uh, the Library of Congress uh, was actually very serious about this uh, conundrum. And uh, the second thing here is they, they commissioned a report, report in 2010 uh, entitled Preserving Virtual Worlds. And uh, it is available. and if this kind of thing, because this to me is interesting, because it's nothing I ever thought of before I first heard about it. I went, wow. Um, that paper I have read, it's all 200 pages of it, it is fascinating. It's really worth a read. Uh, the, uh, uh, they did an excellent job on it, and you'll understand the difference between uh, virtualization and emulation and a lot of other things. So if you've got a computer background at all, uh, and you're interested in old, old, old software, uh, it's a fascinating read. Uh, there's the URL there. Uh, nowadays, we're getting file collections. Okay, so somebody else did the digitization, and now they come up and say, hey, we want you to have our collection. Oh, thanks. Um, they, this happened uh, uh, recently. Uh, we imported 14,000 files from the history makers which is an African-American oral history project in Chicago. And they contacted us, and they said, hey, we've got all these things. Uh, how would you like them? And originally, it was going to be videotapes. And they said, well, wait a minute. You know, we've digitized these things already. Oh, yeah? OK. Well, heck, we'll take those. <laughs> and um, I'm glad we did, but it was so much more work than if they just gave us videotapes. Because we had to create new systems for importing 14,000 bucks. Remember the fix any checks thing I talked about earlier, the SHA-1 checksums? We took the SHA-1 checksums all the way back from when the files were created in Chicago, and we carry that number and check. It's 8.30. It's 8.30, so I'm out of time. <laughs> we go all the way to the end, and we can still match that fix any check number all the way back to the beginning, so that we know that we have the file, it hasn't been 
uh, it's just perfect the way it was. So, uh, and you do that 14,000 times, you, you get good at it in practice. Um, the other thing is because of that number is so large, you can't have a person have to do something. Even if they only have to type three letters, they have to do it 14,000 times. Uh, so uh, we knew that this was exactly what we needed to kind of get a kick in the pants to get started down the road of automating this type of process. Right now we're working on a project called the American, uh, um, the American Archive Project. It's the old PBS library. It's, we're doing it in conjunction with WGBH in Boston. And it's all those PBS shows that you remember. Um, and uh, we have no fear now. Why? Because we did 14,000 of these files for this. Um, the American Archive Project is significantly larger than this. Uh, but it doesn't matter because as long as we don't have to, as long as there's no personnel involved on a one-to-one -one relationship with files, uh, it doesn't matter. Um, Dick Cavett. Dick Cavett was an interesting one in that they gave us their collection. All of Dick's tapes from all of his shows, the PBS show, uh, the ABC <coughs> show, all of them. And we said, thank you very much. And we said, oh, by the way, part of the agreement and gift is you give us, uh, you give us uh, ProRes QuickTime files back of all of the shows. So we had to digitize them right away because they had a time frame that they wanted these files back. So we not only had to digitize them quickly, which gave us a kick in the pants, but we had to convert them because if you notice that, that list of files, we don't use ProRes files <laughs> in our facility. So we had to be come up with a quick method of making all these different kind of files. Uh, so that was, uh, it's been a real pain, but uh, it was one I'm glad we took because now when people ask us about things like that, we show no fear. <laughs> um, I would strongly urge you to avail yourself of this website. It's real easy to remember, loc.gov. And there are, um, blogs. Uh, there actually is content. There's schedules of the event, so if you decide to go to um, you decide to go to Culpeper someday, uh, you can uh, go to one of our screenings. Um, uh, there's a list of all the screenings and what's going on every month. Um, and there are film, video, and recorded sound content online. Um, and the thing, a thing called the National Jukebox. The National Jukebox is a, it's a fascinating thing, especially if you're interested in foxtrots of the 20s and things like that. But uh, these are all classic recordings. They're all public domain. And that's the thing that we have to work around is the fact that we cannot, uh, I mean, certainly the last thing we want to do is screw up anybody's copyrights. And I came out on time. <laughs> Thank you very much. digital projects, this uh, falls under the heading of, um, and I, when I talk to IT guys about this, they look like deer in the headlights kind of look, because it is, oh my god, there's so many petabytes that's out there that how, how can, how, yeah, um, they, they would dearly love to do that, not only that, is there's one project I didn't even mention, where they want to take every television network feed that's going on everywhere at all times and record those live. But there's a problem because the Copyright Office says that we can't record published works. And we won't know that it's a published work sometime till weeks after it airs. And so it's this weird condition where we have files come in that we have to go, oh, oh I'm sorry, we didn't mean to record that. I, I, you know, the problems aren't getting easier, they're getting more and more uh, complex, but they are on that accessioning side. If this isn't, we can archive anything. We got 100 petabytes, we can archive anything. It's what we should be archiving, but we shouldn't be archiving, that's, that's the thing. And that's for the curatorial people, and, and they, they really have a quandary there. Uh, websites, uh, there are um, things that People may not want up on their website anymore. You hear about Twitter and things like that, that people pull these things down. Well, how would you like it? As soon as you publish something, there's a permanent record of it forever. 
for all time. Uh, there are, are moral issues in this as well. Anybody else? Yes? How do you um, compare yourself, or do you work with a group like the Paley Institute? Paley, oh, oh. Um, okay, so there are numerous outreach things that we're doing. We're uh, working uh, currently it's kind of like what's the next bright shiny object. I mean, we are, uh, we go to EMEA, and we take part in, uh, in uh, presentations at EMEA, and we try to work, with, I've had meetings with Smithsonian, NASA, all kinds of other things. There's a group called INDIP, uh, which is the National Digital uh, Archive. In fact, that's what the web thing is under INDIP. Um, um, there are many uh, numerous outreach programs the problem I have seen with outreach programs is if they contact one another way, way up here by the uh, librarian's office, they have a difficult time actually getting traction down below. But if I talk to somebody with the Smithsonian or American Archive Project and they say, can you do this? I go, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Okay. So it, it's very difficult to, for two institutions to connect at a low level. They most commonly do it at high levels. And uh, for all the promise of these um, interactions or uh, uh, joint uh, uh, projects, I haven't seen a, a too many of them uh, uh, really. Uh, like INDIP generates a lot of meetings, but I haven't seen really too much good come out of it. Um, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be happy to be shown if proved wrong, but I really haven't seen it. So, another one up here? Can you? Talk through the process. Let's say I would want to use some of the material that's in a newsreel. Yes. You have, and I want to use as part of the B roll for documentary and fairy material on it. Yeah. How do I how do I find out about it, look at it, make a copy, satisfy the copyright issues? Good question. <laughs> um, I the reason it's a good question because there's something I completely overlooked in this presentation, and that's our PSO office, public service. And on this website, on this website, you can contact the PSO office, or you can probably talk to the person where you have them get a hold of me. We have a PSO office. The very first thing you have to know is kind of where it might be. Um, for instance, newsreels are particularly problematic to catalog because they change, you know, um, they don't like it when things keep changing when they're trying to catalog something. Uh, so it'd be difficult to find a real film, but if you could, tell us who had the, who, you know, which of the movie uh, newsreels it was, and contact, they could get you 35 millimeter print. They cannot, however, grant you use letter. The use letter has to come from the copyright holder, but they can't tell you who the copyright holder is. or whether it's in public domain. So you need to talk to the PSO office. A PSO office, uh, I don't have a phone number or anything. Ryan's our guy. Um, uh, but um, uh, if you wanted to look at film, you're going to have to go to DC. Is that a walk-in walk basis or reservation? Or well, you know, that's a good question. Uh, I've never had to do it myself. In fact, I've only been to Washington about seven or eight times. Uh, I, I had to go to a class one time, it was a nightmare. Um, but um, um, I can get you more information on that. I, I absolutely can get you more information on that. But there is a way, because, all right, last off-topic uh, story. Um, there's a guy who has a list of all the Ted Mac amateur hours. And he somehow or another connects with all these other people. I don't know, I've never seen ads for it and stuff like that. The library charges a ridiculously cheap rates for their material because we're not allowed to make a profit because the taxpayers of the United States already paid for all this. All we're allowed to charge them is what it costs us. And it costs us money. But anyway, he sells people VHS tapes still of their grandfather's performance on the Tegnac Amateur Hour, even though the Tegnac Amateur Hour has been in public domain for, for decades, 
But he <laughs> takes these and makes these videotapes, and he'll send them to them. And it's the family's dream come true, but he paid, they paid way too much money for it, and then we get all the work for it, including me. So, but he puts his own labels over the uh, He's not evil, but he's, he, he, um, uh, he wouldn't, yeah. It's, uh, it's a uh, uh, amusing story uh, about a very entrepreneurial guy. Is that it? The light went out. So. Oh, one more here. Do you ever get impacted by congressional politics, by <laughs> leadership, or government shutdowns? Yeah, government shutdowns, we were shut down. <laughs> that was funny. It, I don't want to go into another long story. Uh, but yeah, I was on vacation during the government shutdown, and so I was either going to get paid by vacation or not paid at all. You don't get your vacation pay, you get your vacation refunded, and then Congress retroactively pays you. So I was off for two, two, two and a half weeks, and I actually got paid, and I got on my vacation back. So it was, I can't complain, but I was impacted. Do you find that your budget is stable no matter who's No, our budget's all wacky. Uh, we lost a bunch to sequestration, uh, and we uh, are getting some of that back, uh, but we're not back to pre-sequestration uh, levels. Um, but that's just the way it is. One last one, sorry. One last one. Um, do you exclusively deal with American-created content? For example, oh. for example, if you're dealing with multiple video formats, yeah. and you've got the NTSC in the US, and you've got PAL, and you've got CCAM, how do you, uh, do you take all of that, or do you go, we're only going to deal with things that were generated <coughs> by Americans? Or no, American uh, we have uh, one of our big projects, which we're just winding up, is the Indonesian news on VHS tape. But it's PAL VHS tape, uh, which means that our robot can't play it because they don't have PAL decks in them. So we had, I can't remember, over a thousand tapes that had to be chucked in by human beings one at a time. Uh, uh, we do foreign films, certainly. Uh, one of my favorite is the, the one where the rocket ship hits the moon in the eye. Uh, that uh, is a French film, and we've got uh, many copies of that. Uh, but uh, what we do, and it's uh, apostasy, I know, but since it is the U.S. Library of Congress, we have on video content, we'll convert it to NTSC. When, back in the days when they were looking at them on televisions and monitors, now that it's on computers, it really doesn't matter anymore. We can do 25. Uh, 30 hertz, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't make, make any difference one way or the other. And in HD, we frequently do 24 frame for uh, film, unless it's silent film, and then we do 30, because you can't, because silent film wasn't 24 frame, it was whatever you crank 